Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You and before you turn, turn over to watch Julia Somerville on News at 10 let me assure you that she does feature on this show as well. <laughs> uh, elsewhere in the news this week after a pilot falls ill with food poisoning the only passenger not to have had the meal steps forward to take over the controls. <laughs> Commuters react as the 6.45 to East Croydon leaves Victoria on time. <laughs> and in Westminster, a man whose days must surely be numbered as the tide of public opinion begins to turn meets the Prime Minister. Speaking of which, on Ian Hislop's team, a man who, uh, in his capacity as head of arts programmes, has made London Weekend's cultural output what it is today, one hour a week. <laughs> <laughs> and with Paul Merton tonight, a man who was one of the ultimate victims of Thatcher's Britain, a male impressionist, Mike Yarwood. <laughs> So once more into the breach that is round one, Ian and Melvin, chapter 94 of the never-ending saga for you. Ah, right, Freddie Mercury competition. <laughs> Peter Lilly, Kenneth Baker. This is the A1 Tech, the follow-up to the Matrix Churchill, where the uh, government set up a lot of British businessmen and then dumped on them. Many of you will know the feeling. And um, <laughs> they were gagging orders, really? what he was signing. Both him and um, Peter Lilly were signing these bits of paper that stop information going before a court that might um, let you off. <laughs> and these four blokes sold, well, deodorants, they said they were, um, to Iraq, but they were arms. And the government was fully aware of this and said, yeah, go on, sell them. And then Customs said, are these blokes selling arms to Iraq? we better arrest them. The government said, I've no idea. <laughs> it was the government, as usual, trying to get people in jail mm. so they can let them out later. <laughs> Is this a current affairs programme? It is, in theory, yes. I thought it was a sort of a light entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> well, we do our best. Yeah. This government is light entertainment. <laughs> you wouldn't be Labour lovers by any chance, would you? Labour lovers? Oh, well, it's just a shot in the dark. How dare you call me Labour? Lovers <laughs> How was your meeting with Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> um, brief. Okay. <laughs> yes, it is the case of uh, businessman Paul Grecian, is the uh, person involved, uh, who is uh, encouraged by the government to sell arms to Iraq uh, and to spy for MI6. Uh, that is until he was arrested for selling arms to Iraq. <laughs> uh, Paul Grecian was uh, given the code name Raven by his spy masters, obviously in the prior knowledge that he was never going to leave the Tower of London. <laughs> uh, Paul and Mike. Uh, this is the this is the headless pig they're breeding. <laughs> the sausage doesn't answer back. Oh, um, <laughs> is that Lord Nolan? Lord Nolan. Edward Heath. Edward Heath. Is it North? Uh, go away. <laughs> <laughs> mm. You know the MPs have to declare everything they earn and all that kind of thing, and it was and the Labour won the vote by something like 53 votes. I think it's a it's a lot of fuss. I mean, you know, if MPs want to earn a bob or two outside, if it's legal, well, what the heck, you know. I mean, I'll be perfectly honest with you, if I'd been offered a fee to appear on this show, I would have taken it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and why did we see Ted Heath there? Well, why not? He's a nice man. <laughs> Ted, Heath, Ted Heath was the senior man protesting against his... That's right. It was an amazing argument in the Commons. The, the argument was that Tory MPs have to have these extremely well-paid outside jobs, or they have no connection with the real world. <laughs> It's funny they don't get jobs as hospital porters. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get the Tories, isn't it, tonight? And that's another thing. So with Tory now, they never get their full title, Conservative. Tory, Tory, Tory. The full the title is crook. <laughs> <laughs> Do we sense you're a bit upset about this? <laughs> I do think things have been a bit lopsided recently, frankly. And, <laughs> and, and you're here to set things straight. Not really. I just talked myself out of even less for work than I'm getting already. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's time for a right-wing comedian. <laughs> Cabinet's nearly empty. <laughs> Ian and Melvin, smile please. It's Julia Somerville. Yes, Julia Somerville. It's Boots' new service. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you take 
make your film in, and they put your picture on the front of the sun. <laughs> Dr. Bruce fought back quickly and said that that man in his head cover of Sheldon worked for Kodak. And uh, people seem to think that blame is really at the police station, where some policeman, the maid just have phoned up a newspaper and said, we've got Julia Somerville here, and uh, her partner is accused of taking these many photographs of this child. It's disgraceful it's got public, uh, and uh, people won't go to Boots, Kodak, or police stations ever again. We'll have... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Isn't Julia Somerville the, uh, the person that Ian looks like? What's it look like? Jimmy. Oh, it's Jimmy. <laughs> Although now you yeah, say yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when pushed on whether a policeman had leaked the story, Scotland Yard said, none of our officers are responsible. <laughs> you yeah. knew that already, didn't you? <laughs> Julia Somerville's employers, ITN, said it's totally ridiculous to suggest that anyone who took pornographic photos would have them developed at boots. <laughs> Unless you get a much quicker service at Snappy Snaps. <laughs> According to a child psychologist, Ray Wire, even as adults, we get uncomfortable when our elderly parents bring out snaps of us naked lying on rugs, especially if they were taken last New Year's Eve. <laughs> Paul and Mike, what's all this then? Oh, I know. Oh. Yes, this is, I know this, this is Northampton. The, the, they've decided that the police are going to sort of chase, because it'd be cheaper to chase villains on bus. <laughs> they get on the bus, so some bank robbers are away, getting away, and they'll follow them in the bus. <laughs> and after a while, the bank robbers will say, well, there's no point in having a getaway car, let's just go down a road that doesn't have a bus route. <laughs> And the police will be going, oh, I need to turn left past the post office, we'll, we'll get off at the next stop. <laughs> Where's it happening? Northampton. It's correct. I'm going to have to give you all the points. Uh, a spokesman uh, admitted that uh, it could lengthen the response time to a police call out. Uh, though when they do come now, three or four will come at once. <laughs> Which uh, daylight robbery brings us bang to right at the end of round one, and the situation is that uh, neither side has stolen any kind of march, both sitting pretty on four. Well, later in the program, the teams can look forward to being forced on pain of death to compose some amusing captions to this. Something to be getting on with in uh, moments of heightened tedium. Well, it's uh, time now for a special never-to-be-repeated one-off round, uh, that's unless it works, uh, which we've called our Impersonation Challenge. Uh, this features... <laughs> this uh, features our high-tech impressionometer, uh, which will, there it is, uh, randomly select a series of celebrities, and every time it does, uh, both teams have to nominate one person to do an impression of that celebrity. <laughs> points for whichever one is uh, the better will then be in my gift. Uh, obviously, uh, with a top professional impressionist on the panel in the shape of Ian Hislop. <laughs> it's going to be pretty one-sided. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let's waste no more time and roll the impressionometer. <laughs> Impressive, huh? And uh, who'd have thought? Harold Wilson. Um, Paul, who are you nominating um, um, to... Uh, I'll do this one. <laughs> we need the points. Yeah. <laughs> it's a um, controversial uh, decision. Uh, Ian, uh, who's going to do yours? Um, Melvin. <laughs> Paul, let's They're going to be quite yours. short, can't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. Well, I think as I said at the Brighton Conference in 1960... <laughs> I didn't know Harold Wilson was Welsh. <laughs> no, it was uh, positively... Uh, <laughs> no, no, that was very good. Very good. Yes, yeah, he's the same thing he says himself, really, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ian, uh, let's hear yours. Well, uh, well, it's hell up here in heaven, really. Uh, but I'm going to modernise it with the white eating technology. It'll take a long time. It'll take, uh, it'll take me a very long time, but then, uh, then I've got a very long time. <laughs> Harold Wilson. Yeah. 
Well, well, the points very obviously have to go to Paul and Mike's team. Um, uh, so to our uh, second chillingly accurate impersonation for which we roll the impressionometer. Why do I feel my career has ended? <laughs> and astonishingly, it's another voice from yesteryear, Eddie Waring, the, uh, the late, great rugby league commentator. Paul, who are you going to nominate uh, this time? Mr. Yarwood, I'm sure. <laughs> ah, well, you say now. We used to commentate on the rugby up in an hour park. <laughs> Endless and all. Oh, and I'll tell you this again. Uh, Ian, what about your team? Um, I'm nominating Melvin again. <laughs> just, uh, just do the same as you did last <laughs> Can you just give us a hint? Well, <laughs> <that'll be>, ah, <laughs> just ah, a yeah. well, obviously we have to give the points uh, to Melvin. Uh, <laughs> let's now see who's thrown up this time as we roll the impressionometer. Incredibly, the random selection is 70s heartthrob Melvin Bragg. <laughs> So, uh, Paul, who are you going to nominate? Who's going to happen? Oh, I'll have a go at it, obviously. All right, so it's Paul Merton. Ian? During the days when he sounded like Howard Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> who are you going to choose, Ian? Oh. Um, I'm going to nominate Melvin. <laughs> Paul? I can't do it at all. Neither can Melvin. No. <laughs> <laughs> On the South Bank show this evening, <laughs> Do George Harrison is said. Well, the thing about the Beatles was... <laughs> the reason why we were called the Beatles, because that was the name we thought of at the time. <laughs> That's Lily Savage. <laughs> that was not how it was. More than one person who comes from Liverpool. <laughs> I can yeah. do a very good Alec Guinness. Yeah, the Liverpool constituency. Uh, yes, uh, how's it go? Alec Guinness, in, the, in Kind Hearts and Coronets, is the old priest, mm. when Dennis Price is walking around, and he's the old priest showing him around the church, and he says, um, The view from my west window <laughs> has all the exuberance of Chaucer, with none of the concomitant crudities of the period. <laughs> Julian. Thank you. Julian Clary. Yes, I'm sure you can. Thank you. Um, Melvin, would you like to try Melvin Bragg? Yeah, it goes something like this. That's uh, fine, thank you. No, no. <laughs> it's not easy to do yourself, that's very good. Mm. Unless you're very lonely. <laughs> <laughs> told you. Uh, I'm going to give the, uh, the marks uh, to Melvin for uh, impersonating himself. Uh, right, for the uh, final time then, let's roll that impressionometer. <laughs> And uh, yes, out of all those it could have chosen, it's the familiar face of popster Jimmy Somerville. Uh, Paul, who are you nominating to impersonate Jimmy Somerville? Do you know who Jimmy Somerville is? Well, he's a, uh, 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 he's a pop singer. Yeah, I'll I'm do not it. Like that. <laughs> now? Uh, yeah, go on then. Well, I first joined the Communards in 1968. <laughs> That's Eddie Waring, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, Ian. Uh, Don't leave me this way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can't um, <laughs> uh, imagine doing question time again. <laughs> A faultless uh, impersonation until he started singing. Uh, <laughs> like you can have the point. So Jimmy Thumbrell was uh, in Geneva last week uh, where he was so appalled by the sight of uh, 12 lobsters living in a tank at a seafood restaurant uh, that he bought the lot for £1,000 and in spite of the waiter's uh, protestations, released them all into the lake. Uh, unfortunately, because they're sea creatures, uh, <laughs> Geneva, it was a freshwater lake, they all died instantly. <laughs>
uh, which uh, impressionable nonsense uh, brings this round to an end and uh, well a short march uh, now does seem to have been stolen uh, with Paul and Mike on five and Ian and Melvin just ahead on seven Uh, almost over familiar odd one out round now follows uh, four memorable James Bonds, which runs the George Lazenby. Uh, Paul, your uh, four towering intellects are Harold Pinter, Eric Bristow, Michael Caine, and Brandon Lee. Well, uh, Michael Caine, uh, Howard Pinter, and Eric Bristow were all in a band called Fister, they, which they they started in the early sixties. They made a record called Losing the Light, which was on the uh, Bowman Records label, I think. And I think Brandon Lee's the odd one out because the other three all formed this band when at the same school together. The drugs that Paul is on tonight <laughs> are available. Any chemist if you get the combination, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, it's not actually the right answer. I have to, well, uh, the Brandon Lee is, is the odd one out. Uh, Brandon Lee is the odd one out. Yes, That's and the other right. three went to the same school, which is, is Hackney Downs, which is just going to close on the uh, beginning of the new year. Bugger. <laughs> Uh, the answer is that an invite or just a... <laughs> <laughs> couldn't uh, manage him and his wife. Uh, the, answer, <laughs> the answer is... Um, oh, I didn't hear that. What did you say? Uh, <laughs> I was just giving you the answer, Paul. Uh, the odd one out is Brandon Lee, uh, whose real name is Brian McKinnon, who at the age of 32 re-entered his old school, uh, Bears Den, as a pupil and studied there for 12 months before being found out. Uh, in fact, he only gave his age away when he asked the teacher where the new textbooks were. Uh, <laughs> Michael Caine attended Hackney Downs, and his first ever words on stage were in a school nativity play, My Name's Virgin Mary. <laughs> oh, 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 hang on. Was that a nearly an impression? Dangerously close. There was <laughs> no, not dangerously close. Dangerously <laughs> far away. <Yeah. laughs> no, good. Then everybody else has had to do it. What's that then? Michael Caine. I've just done him. No, you haven't. <laughs> You've done a vague approximation of some sort of Cockney accent you might have heard on a bus somewhere when you, <laughs> when you didn't have any money. But let's have, right. let's have Michael Caine. Right. My name's Michael Caine. <laughs> might be more impressive if the floor manager didn't have to start the applause. In the uh, Mike. Chris Eubank. Lord Sterling. Diane Abbott, MP, and Colin the Pigeon. <laughs> Chris Eubank just retired from boxing. Diane Abbott hasn't. <laughs> he might have, I don't know. Um, As Bob Monkhouse would say, I really am. I... <laughs> <laughs> He's like Diane Abbott. She's the only one who hasn't had a shit in Trafalgar Square. <laughs> Abbott is the only woman. Now that might not be the right answer, but it is a correct answer, isn't it? Well, Colin's the only pigeon. Well, Lord Sterling was in the news recently because he was um, he was caught on a train not having paid for his ticket. Chairman of P&O, quite entertaining, and he said, "I couldn't buy a ticket because there were all these people at the ticket windows that are buying tickets, and I couldn't wait. I'm Lord Sterling." So he got on the train and the ticket collector came and said, where's your ticket? And he said, um, I haven't got one. And the bloke said, all right, you can pay the ticket and the fine. And Lord Sterling said, I'll give you the money, whatever it is, I have some change, but I won't pay the fine. And he, um, the ticket collector, obviously, I'm putting this politely, said, yes, you will, mate. <laughs> and Lord Sterling went through the normal procedures of ringing up this ticket collector's boss and saying, I'm Lord Sterling, drop this. And the boss went, yes, of course, sir. I'll give you one for that. Um, uh, the answer is that they've all been caught on trains without a valid ticket, uh, except Colin the Pigeon, who being a pigeon tends to go on challenge. Um, in fact, the uh, New Scientist magazine reported recently that some pigeons have actually learnt how to travel up and down the London Underground system inside tube trains, although some of them are still having trouble with the Northern Line splitting in two at Kennington. <laughs> When, uh, when Chris Eubank was found uh, without the right ticket, police warned him that he didn't have to say anything, but only he did say he was likely to be pretentious twaddle. <laughs> Melvin, your creative quartet, 
uh, Elton John, uh, Rachel White Reed, uh, Christo, and Christo. Rachel White Reed um, did a sculpture of a house, a house-sized house, uh, in the East End of London, inside Inside Out, which uh, was highly acclaimed uh, by people, was a source of pride to a lot of people in the area, and of course was knocked down by the council. <laughs> um, the Christos wrap houses up in uh, various materials to conceal them. They're performance artists, except yeah. Milton. <laughs> I'll give you one point. Uh, the answer is that uh, they've all been involved in wrapping up buildings, apart from artist Rachel Whiteread, uh, who filled a terraced house in Mile End with liquid concrete, an act that won widespread praise from the art world, but severe criticism from the Hickson family who were inside watching Coronation Street at the time. <laughs> uh, Elton John once wrapped the music venue Hammersmith Odeon in pink and green striped paper with a red ribbon and gift tag that read, Merry Christmas, Love from Elton. A wasted effort, as unfortunately that year his wife Renata had actually wanted a Garfield pyjama case. <laughs> and finally in this round, uh, Ian, Agatha Christie, Mystic Meg, Alistair Campbell, <laughs> and Melvin Bragg. <laughs> Only one of them is a novelist. <laughs> <laughs> Mystic Meg um, comes up with predictions for the lottery, but not the numbers, does she? No, I think that would make it too easy for people. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm guessing, but... Yeah. Alistair Campbell is Blair's assistant. Is it to do with predict... anything to do with... Campbell got... Campbell hit a bloke in the Commons once. He hit a journalist from The Guardian. Right. Who made a Maxwell joke on the night he died. Michael White said he was doing an impression and he said, you should have seen him, it was Bob, 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 Bob. <laughs> this is true, and Campbell was working at the mirror. <laughs> then Campbell went and hit him. Out of loyalty. Naturally. He's yeah. a loyal guy. Of course he is. He was loyal to Maxwell, he's loyal to Blair. That's right. I didn't say he had taste, I said he's loyal. <laughs> <laughs> it is a literary question. You were sort of in the right area initially. Is Mystic Meg a novelist? She has written a novel. What is it? <laughs> it's like a it's long like... book with <laughs> loads of words. And then you turn the page and then there's another load of words and oh, it's right. all made up out of your own head. Um, it is that all of them, except Agatha Christie, have written pornographic literature. Oh! Um, uh, <laughs> God, God, I really like that moment. You're not saying that... Yeah, I'm not saying. Because. The bank manager bonks the 16-year-old was pornographic. No. <laughs> First she was 18. Right. And we don't call it bonking in my novel. Right. Uh, was it a bonk manager then? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> was it published in hardback? Yes. <laughs> Well, some of those are quite difficult to hold up with one man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, well, Melvin Bragg uh, won the Literary uh, Review's Bad Sex Prize, as far as I'm aware. He was uh, nominated twice, uh, once for this extract from his novel uh, Crystal Rooms. Uh, she came to a climax feasting oh. on him, greedily kissing. <laughs> Until the piercing moment when she shuddered on and he turned her pushed in deep as she lay face down and kept tension and tension as Mark drove in. How are you in the garage? <laughs> Agatha Christie, of course, is the odd one out that she never wrote any pornography, apart from the scene where Miss Marple uh, lay face down, fist clenching and unclenching as the Major drove in. <laughs> uh, Tony Blair's press secretary, Alastair Campbell, uh, used to write pornography for Forum magazine. Uh, Mystic Meg wrote steamy stories for Men Only magazine, although Mystic Meg is obviously a pseudonym, uh, her real name being Mystic Doris. <laughs> All of which, uh, Rumpy Pumpy, brings us uh, bouncing to the end of this odd round. And the latest news is that, uh, well, Paul and Mike are playing dead with eight, whilst Ian and Melvin are alive and kicking with nine. Which uh, only leaves us time to scoot through a few missing words. Our guest publication this week uh, being the magazine you just can't put down, uh, or indeed pick up, Concrete. <laughs> the concrete magazine for the construction industry. Uh, anyway, away we go with gin drinking turns donkeys into what? Highly desirable beings. <laughs> uh, into really unpleasant kind of guys. 
Well, that's not far off. Very poor mixes is how it puts it. <laughs> puts it. Uh, next, it's true. Uh, next, it's German what day? Concrete. <laughs> Oddly enough, it is the right answer. <laughs> it's, uh, it's April the 28th, if you want to put it in the day. <laughs> in Hamburg. Um, mm. Next, supermarket thrust bananas into what? Lady, but she is still a dissatisfied customer. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> not verbatim what I've got here. Very surprised man, tiny shoelaces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lovely image. High it? Street Fruit War. <laughs> High Street Fruit War. You don't need to say it twice, I can hear you. <laughs> the front line of Price War is uh, mm. correct. Uh, next, hot and cold weather effect plastic what? Poly A. <laughs> not allowed to say those words, Miriam. No. <laughs> Plastic concrete is the right answer. <laughs> and finally, I thought what? I thought I saw a pussy cat <laughs> creeping up on me. I did. I saw a pussy cat uh, creeping up on me. <laughs> I'm afraid uh, your answer does actually make more sense than uh, than the right one, which is, I thought Lenny Loud and Revolting only was shocked by some of gentle he was. Uh, the story of the real Lenny Henry, as reported in the Daily Mail on Wednesday, uh, presumably after a particularly good lunch at the typesetters. <laughs> Uh, which uh, faultless impersonation of headless chickens uh, brings us to the final throws of this week's bout and the outcome is that Paul and Mike are this week's mashed turnips with eight whilst uh, Ian and Melvin are this week's magic mushrooms with 13. So uh, to our winners, the chance to turn on the Oxford Street Christmas lights. Uh, to our losers, the job of getting them out of the attic and trying to find which bulb has blown. <laughs> Uh, sadly, there's just time to wrap up our caption competition, so what do you think of this? Don't worry, Mr. Parker Bowles, I'm doing this operation. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard the joke about the new Disney film that's got Will Carling in it? <laughs> it's called Pocahontas. <laughs> 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 and I leave you with news that in Yeovil, the Liberal Democrats policy advisers go out for a quick bike ride. <laughs> After the man at number 35 Acacia Gardens fails to return the man at number 36's lawnmower, a local police fear an escalation. And after Keith Richards complains that his left nostril is blocked, a team of specially trained experts go in. Good night. <laughs>